Welcome back to Strange Form. Today, we are going to be looking at G.I. Joe Classified 59. CoverGirl, with Classified number 64, Falcon, being a close contender, CoverGirl is probably the worst head sculpt of the entire line, which is sort of hilarious because her whole gimmick is that she's the looker of the group. This figure has sent a veritable army of G.I. Joe collectors, myself included, scouring the shelves for suitable replacement heads. And from what I'm seeing across the net, Marvel seems to be the go-to for alternate head sculpts, as Hasbro's Marvel figures share similar toy engineering, with a great deal of parts being interchangeable. Kind of ironic as the cover girl box art makes her look like the Marvel character Squirrel Girl, another figure with universally terrible head sculpts. Not wanting to follow the pack, I came up with a different solution. But let's not waste any more time and get into it, shall we? Right out of the box, I'm impressed with the costume. She has a real 1940s aviator or adventurer look that harkens back to the likes of Indiana Jones, Tomb Raider, and a pinch of Amelia Earhart. But I can also immediately see here why the head sculpt is so immediately off-putting to people. She does have a fairly nice accessory loadout, but unfortunately no way to sling the shotgun. It's not a big deal, but it would have been cool if she came with a tank operator rucksack, though this is easily rectified with the plethora of extra accessories I have from both this line and the Action Force line. This is one of those figures that I would actually like to see correct with a Night Force variant, complete with black leather jacket and black pants, and maybe a tanker helmet and goggles. This would give Hasbro the chance to double dip, as many would probably buy too, if it had a better head sculpt that could also be used with this release. As for accessories, she comes with what looks like a Benelli Supernova tactical shotgun. This one is actually far less gummy material than a lot of the current releases, and is holding its rigidity nicely. Something that looks like a very Tomb Raider inspired HK P30L tablet with a fun little screenshot of Miss Krieger's Wolverine missile tank. And lastly, an adjustable wrench, which I believe is the same one that came with Clutch, but in all black rather than red and black two-tone. Now, since Ollie's has been filling their shelves with extremely cheap Fortnite figures, I have been kit-rating a few of them to make some interesting concept figures. One of those figures I've been working on is a Valkyrie BAT, so to go along with Lexa here, I picked up the Fortnite Jewels figure for the Owl Wings, and a few other accessories such as the Welder's Mask, which I plan on repainting and using later. But I actually really like the head sculpt on Jewels, which immediately struck me as a cuter Gidget fashion model style face, and much softer than a lot of the other Marvel sculpts that are being used. Now, to me, the original head sculpt here looks like someone tried to cast Joan Rivers as a blocky original late 90s PS1 game Lara Croft. The forehead is too high, and the brow ridges are entirely too pronounced, and the cheeks are way too gaunt. It's the perfect storm for a really garish face that especially doesn't look good with any overhead lighting. And there's definitely something almost drag show-esque about the makeup applications here. By contrast, the Fortnite head is far less angular. Now the hair and the head are two separate pieces, so it would be easy to swap out for a more cartoon or 80s figure accurate hairdo, but I actually really like the braids. And stay tuned to the end to see her hair and goggles repainted to match the original better. You could also probably easily buff out the nose ring if you're going for a more 80s accurate style, but to me, it completes the tank girl aesthetic. Originally released with the Wolverine tank in 1983, and subsequently appearing in the G.I. Joe comic number 16, and the animated series episode, The Worms of Death, Courtney Covergirl Krieger's original dossier reads, Covergirl was a high fashion model in Chicago and New York prior to enlistment, who grew disillusioned with modeling and enlisted to put a new direction in her life attended armor school at Fort Knox, proficient in diesel mechanics, gas turbine technology, qualified expert, law rocket, dragon AT missile, M16, and 1911A auto pistol. Covergirl finds that she must work against her beauty to prove herself. She's compelled to learn and master decidedly unfeminine disciplines. Her self-assurance and stunning good looks reduce most men to stuttering fools. Her second dossier reads, Covergirl was a fashion model in Chicago and New York prior to enlistment. She grew disillusioned with the shallow world of modeling and joined the military to take her life in a more meaningful direction. Now, instead of being swathed in silk, she is covered in grease and couldn't be happier. She is proficient in diesel mechanics and gas turbine technology, can perform diagnostics, maintenance, and repair on any AFV that rolls into her vehicle bay, and can even fabricate new parts from scrap metal in the field. This glamour girl turned grease monkey 
feels completely at home in the G.I. Joe garage, where her only real challenge is fending off the advances of some of the team's more amorous lug nuts. CoverGirl is not only a highly skilled mechanic, she is also responsible for piloting vehicles to transport personnel and cargo from the G.I. Joe team. Proficient with operating all vehicle-mounted weapon systems to protect the convoy, she can also perform vehicle self-recovery as well as provide cover fire while expediting field repairs during battlefield emergencies. So it looks like CoverGirl had to put up with a fair amount of workplace sexual harassment. I really do wish that they would start including dossier cards with the classified line. Let me know in the comments if you would like to see dossier cards make their way back into the series. Despite the issues with the head, I actually really like this figure. However, I think that she is a perfect case study for how a poor portrait can completely derail what would have been otherwise an extremely popular figure. And portraits are something that Hasbro has been fairly good at over the years. So I have no idea how this one slipped through quality control and right into production. Especially because just about every alternate head that people are using to rectify this is coming from the same company. Released fairly close together, her and Falcon were sort of a fluke. And since then, the line has done nothing but improve, culminating in the most recent retro release of Duke, the figure that we all wanted from the beginning. As we come to a close, I dug through my Crimson Shadow Pack to outfit her with some more 40s attire matching weaponry in the form of a Thompson and 1911. Nix the tablet and paint the belt buckle a more brass color, and you have a figure that perfectly aligns with her spiritual counterpart, Classified 103, General Clayton Hawk Abernathy, down to the fact that he comes with the same handgun and shotgun as her which kind of makes me wish that Hasbro would do World War II figures for their 60th line. It would be great to have a whole platoon, plus maybe a WLA Harley motorcycle. I like the two 60th anniversary figures that we got, but they are a strange amalgam of real militaria and made-up stuff, like the strange double-barrel M4 that the Action Soldier infantry figure comes with. Lastly, I decided to repaint the hair of the figure and repaint the goggles with brass-colored lens frames, rather than the red and silver. And I, of course, painted her hair red to match the original character, but I'm probably going to go back over it with a flatter paint and a little more brown in so that she doesn't look as much like the Wendy's mascot. Look at her. She looks deeply concerned with where the beef might be. However, overall it's proof of concept. Now, not content to leave well enough alone, I did go ahead and repaint Miss Krieger here. On top of the obvious, i.e. repainting her hair a more cartoon and original 80s figure accurate rusty brown, I also went ahead and put a little more pink into her complexion, changed her lips to a lighter color, and completely removed the Fortnite goggles in favor of a more classified specific pair, Clayton Hawk Abernathy's extra set to be precise. I also put a little bit of scuffing and grease on her cheek where you would rub while doing mechanics Work. I repainted the belt buckles because I felt that the silver was a little out of place with the rest of the outfit, something I might also do with the hawk figure. I went around the entire jacket and painted all of the rivets and buttons on her outfit a metallic copper, and lastly, I shortened the neck slightly so that her proportions were a bit better. I did notice that her entire lower half is actually a repaint of Lady J's legs and boots. I wonder what the actual ratio of swapped parts is amongst the entire line. Overall, I'm really happy with how this one turned out. There there are a lot of awesome head swaps that I've seen done for this one, so I don't think that there's a perfect answer beyond whatever looks best to you. Roll, Tanker, Level 4. Gear, Light Weapons, Level 1. Skill and Mastery, Mechanical Engineering, Level 4. Skill and Mastery, Weapons Development, Level 2. Now, as we wrap things up, I would like to mention the significance of this episode. Though the first three episodes were shot on a Nikon D850, for the rest of the series I have shot every episode on a Canon EOS R5 with a multitude of lenses. But over the last two years, I have owned a red Komodo, which I have been slowly building a production kit around. This episode being the first time that I've actually shot anything on the platform. I purchased these two cameras in specific because they complement each other nicely, the EOS R5 having eight K capabilities and the ability to shoot high resolution slow motion, as well as a compact form factor that makes it easier to use with smaller gimbals and in tight spaces. The red has a global shutter, incredibly robust color management, and a cinematic look that's only paralleled by the RE platform. And the bonus being that both cameras are in the same lens mount ecosystem. Is the purpose of all this equipment to shoot YouTube videos? No. This platform is just a good way of practicing my technique. The overarching goal is to produce a short film, which I hope to be shopping through the film festival circuits later this year. I will begin production on that short film this coming May, 
2024 for those seeing this episode later. The short film will be a horror vignette titled Attachment, a practical effects fairy tale ghost story about the day in the life of a young girl and the spirit who follows her everywhere, which I hope will be the jumping off point to a much larger project I have in mind. In the next episode, I'll have a link for ways that you can help the project if you're so inclined. And in the upcoming uploads, as we prepare for the release of Romulus, I've got some rare alien statues to show you, as well as some thoughts about the trailer. We will also be charging deep into the Egyptian underworld for a special Egyptian Gods Storytime episode, showcasing my upcoming novel and the TB League Egyptian Gods 1-6 scale figures. The latter episode was actually supposed to be the 100th upload, but I've been running far too behind on that one and wanted to get something out sooner. And now for the coveted Shot on Red logo. Now I hope you all enjoyed this episode of Strange Form and will help the channel by liking, commenting, subscribing, and sharing. And as always, remember, never stop collecting.